Can you hear me all right? Absolutely. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, we're going to get started. Go out front, up front here. Hello, everyone. Hello. Food was delicious. Thank you to everyone that helped in any way. So I'm going to miss this until next year. Uh, so we continue with our devotion series. Again, it's the Witness at the Cross from Amy Jill Levine. She goes by AJ. Uh, I have another book, and I also have a DVD. So if this is something you would like to hear more about, I only covered certain things of each section, um, let me know, okay? And we could meet. I just can't live stream the, vi the video, but we certainly could watch it at another time if people are interested in that. <coughs> so tonight we have a lot to cover because uh, we're going to combine sessions five and six together. So um, we have the women at the cross, witness at the cross, the women, and we also have two men, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, that we're going to be talking about. And I also want to, at the end, talk about two additional witnesses, which is nature itself and God of the cross. <clears throat> so let us begin with prayer. Holy God, strengthen us to stand in our own minds and hearts before the cross of Jesus, that the women who witnessed his death and bore the first witness to his resurrection may teach us how to bear faithful witness to him today. 
We ask that you also help us to discover, as did Joseph Arimathea and Nicodemus, the points at which you call us to commit ourselves to righteous action for the sake of your coming kingdom. Amen. <clears throat> so at each table, you will see two visual aids, those uh, gathering at home with us. Henry is going to put up a uh, first visual aid, and then I guess you could go to the second, Henry. The first being two from um, the French artist Tussaud that um, depict the women at the crucifixion. Is there anything that stands out for you, jumps out at you, evokes feelings for you? in these paintings. <clears throat> Have you ever really looked at depictions of Jesus being taken down from the cross before? And how's that? Is it jarring to you? How's that? <clears throat> yeah. How do you feel about the women in the images? Anything jumping out? Sure, rightfully so, right? No, they're men, they're the helpers taking them down, and then there's, <clears throat> and the second one looks like a centurion there, and some women and some men around. Um, the women look very, very distraught. Do you have any thoughts on who some of the women are? They look like they want to take them down and care for them. Yeah. It's really hard to figure out who the women are. I mean, I guess we can figure out from her arms who uh, Mary and mother of Jesus is. Now, I'll have you take a look at the second painting, um, Rubens' painting, the, the Baroque style. Taking Jesus down, a little different. Anything jump out in this one? <clears throat> oh, they look like a rough descent to the other one. Yeah, it's dark, very dark. It's dark, isn't it? Nature, nature's making a statement in that one. It was difficult to get him back on, too. Look at the bowl on the bottom right. That stood out for me. What do you think's in that bowl? The wine. Sense and myrrh. No. Was it the wine? Look at it closer. Red. It's the crown of thorns. Oh. And it's the nails. It's hard to see. This is a really big painting. <clears throat> so um, the, the beloved disciple we were going to say was John, even though we discussed that one session. That's who is in the red. Is supposed to. This is per the artist. It looks like the sign of the cross is in there too. These look like young girls. Oh, is the sign down too? Yeah. 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 You're right. It does. There's some other things there. It's hard to see. <clears throat> and um, on the left, on the ladder, the left side, yeah, that's supposed to be uh, Joseph of Arimathea. Which one? The red Yeah. Not the red on the bottom. That's supposed to be John, the, the beloved disciple. So he's up on the ladder. He's kind of, looks like he's almost got a valorous reddish gold thing going on with a hat. And the beard? Yeah. And then on the right ladder, that's supposed to be Nicodemus. And then we have Mary, the mother of Jesus, is like trying to touch him and almost. And um, in this, uh, Mary Magdalene is depicted with the blonde hair and Jesus' foot is on her shoulder. <coughs> And then that's supposed to be Mary uh, of Clopas next to Mary. Lots of Marys. We talked about that. Common name, Mary. All right. Anything before we move on? So um, let's hear from our first reading, reading number one from Luke chapter 8. 
Soon afterwards, he went on through cities and villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, as well as some women who had been cured of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Herod's steward, Cusa, and Susanna, and many others who provided for them out of their resources. Who provided for them out of their resources. Right? The women provided for Jesus and his <laughs> disciples with their own resources. They were the patronages. Do you think this is information that's widely broadcast through the scriptures? No. No. Any guesses on Luke's intent? In, mes in mentioning it? Wasn't it Luke that kind of lifted up the women in, in the different stories? Luke does mention the women in stories more than the others. Lifting up? That's the question. So in this particular scripture, what do you think the intent is behind it? Because do you feel like the women, these women that were providing all the resources, feeding them, taking care of them, did they have a voice? Yeah. Uh, in a, no, they didn't. You would think, but they didn't. That was, that was um, that's what we call context, right? When we talk about the Bible, you have to peel back the layers, like an onion of context to get to the Word of God. That's why we call it the inspired Word of God. <clears throat> But um, let's hear the reader number two. I've lost track. Is that you, Stan? This is from Luke's account, chapter 24 now. Suddenly two men in dazzling clothes stood beside them. The women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you search for the living among the dead? He is not here, but he is risen. Remember what he told you when he was still in Galilee, saying that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be executed, and on the third day rise up. And they were reminded of his words. And when they returned from the tomb, they, all told, they told all these things to the eleven and to everyone else. Now it was Miriam from Magdala, Joanna, the Miriam of Jacob, and others together with them who were telling these things to the emissaries. But these words appear to them as nonsense, and they would not believe them. But these words appear to them as nonsense, and they did not believe them. These are the patronages. These are the people, the women that were taking care of them, providing all the food. They, they tell the disciples what they have seen, experienced, and they think it's nonsense. So let's go back to... What was it, chapter 8 with Luke? Do you think Luke lifted up those women as being the providers out of gratitude? Just to put the information out there? Or is it possible he put it in there for other women? Again, there's just putting questions out there. For other women who read the gospel accounts, to think, hey, I better do like those women and provide my resources to help the church, even though they didn't have much of a voice in the church. It's hard to know another intent, but it's a valid question. Why put it in there? Are you thanking them? And if you're not, but you're going to disregard what they have to say when they've been so vital in the ministry. Just wanted to point out that the men didn't provide for themselves. That that uh, you know, but they didn't. They were provided for by the women. They weren't going around asking for donations and going around and pestering people and you know. Obviously, well, they were taking donations, right? So you're, you're talking about um, 
like the birds, how God takes feeds the birds of the air and all the so people will feed the disciples. This is why the women need to take over the world, right? The leadership roles. <laughs> Yeah, maybe. Well, yeah, credit has kept them alive for a while. Well, sure. For sure. They were feeding them. So who has uh, number three? We're going to hear from Mark now. We're going to hear from Mark in the 15th chapter of Mark. <coughs> there were also women looking on from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James the Younger, and of Joseph and Salome. They used to follow him and provide for him when he was in Galilee, and there were many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem. He's just now mentioning in chapter 15 the women. Never mentioned the women were in all the other chapters. They followed him up all the way, these women. And they stood at a distance. So why do you think the women might have stood at a distance? Hmm? Well, yeah, they could be executed, too, for sure. The state, hmm? You think it was that, too? Maybe. I don't know. I'm just asking the questions. They were at a distance. But these women followed him. From Galilee, they followed him all the way up when he's dragging the weight of that cross and he's bleeding and he's weeping. They are following him. All their eyes are locked on him and they follow him all the way to Golgotha, Calvary, however you want to refer to it. They were there the whole way and they stayed there at a distance, maybe closer, but they stayed there through it all, these women. So, um, John, who's my fourth reader? You can? Can you read John's gospel account? Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. Jesus calls his mother woman. He's done that before. At Cana. I'm waiting at Cana for him. So any thoughts on that? Why he might call his mother woman? Maybe to protect her, to not to elevate her, <coughs> that she would be that much of a part of him. Maybe. He also went, if you think back at the woman at the well, he called her woman. He didn't call her Samaritan. And actually, I wasn't going to talk about, but scholars actually say Jesus actually has referred to multiple women by woman. And they still aren't really sure why that is. They haven't figured that one out yet, but just putting that out there. Um, but here in Luke's account, chapter 23, I'll read this. A great number of the people followed him, and among them were women who were beating their breasts and wailing for him. But Jesus turned to them and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For the days are surely coming they, when they will say, Blessed are the barren, and the wombs that never bore, and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, Cover us. For if they do this when the wood is green, what will happen when it's dry? So the women, they're, they're wailing. They're so distraught. You see it in that one painting. He's trying to pick that, right? And they're beating their, I won't beat my breast because of the microphone. They're beating their breasts. It's really, you know, when you also hear in the Bible accounts, what do they do? They tear their garments when they weep. You hear that with Jacob, too. They tear it away. So these, again, are the brave women. And they followed him to Calvary, and they have all the eyes on him. Um, 
So they don't stand out in the gospel accounts. They really don't. And they had such important roles for Jesus. So I want to read for you what A.J. writes in her book. Okay, I'm going to quote her on this. The women at the cross have been ignored or reduced to models of simple piety. These women risked their lives for women who were, all, for women were also executed by the state. Some risked their marriages or their relationships with their children, right? They're following Jesus. For the Gospels, as well as Israel's scriptures, women are mothers, but they are also much more. Joanna, Mary Magdalene, Salome, none is identified as a mother. The Bible celebrates marriage and childbirth, but it also celebrates women's religious devotion, patronage, pilgrimage, witness, and a host of other matters not determined by marital status, gender, or sexuality. When Jesus states woman, he is not restricting his conversation partner to a gender role. He is making sure she is noticed. This is what the scholars think. She is noticed. Any comments on that? How are you feeling about the women? They were pretty brave. They were, weren't they? Pretty amazing. They did what they were allowed to do. They weren't supposed to be in front of anything. They were to be behind them. They but even still, they can't be close. very brave. And people can't say a woman can do this, a woman can do, do that, because that was against their thing. I know. We didn't have women. much of a voice back then. Right? They had to be there, it was okay, but be quiet. They weren't Jewish on the her. <coughs> they also knew that what he was doing was important and they believed in it. They paid attention they to were what devout. He, they were devout. They paid attention to what he was about. Yeah. Can you imagine <coughs> how they felt having cared for this man and just watching that? I just the injustice of it, of it all, and bearing witness to it. Well, the women are care people. Right? You're using brought up like that. Well, now you're generalizing, but I hear you. No, you are. Yeah. Are you going to mansplain me now, Wade? <laughs> that's, that's always good. It has to be like that. Okay. We're going to move on now to two men. <laughs> two men. Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. All right, so all four gospel writers, they mention Joseph of Arimathea. We don't really know where this Arimathea is. It's a Jewish town. That's what we know. That's what, there's maybe some guesses out there, but they don't know. But he, what we do know is he had a tomb in Jerusalem. So he probably was a man of means, and he was also a very devout ma man. He was waiting for the kingdom of God to come. He wanted to make sure his tomb was right there at the place where it was going to happen. So he's got this tomb in Jerusalem. Um, from John's Gospel in the 19th chapter, we hear that he is a secret disciple of Jesus. He's afraid of the Jews. All right, so this is what Luke wrote in the 23rd chapter. I'm going to read for you. Now, there was a good and righteous man named Joseph who, though a member of the council, had not agreed to their plan and action. He came from the Jewish town of Arimathea, and he was waiting expectantly for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down, wrapped it in a linen cloth, and laid it in a rock-hewn tomb where no one had ever been laid. When Jesus was alive... Joseph didn't speak up among the Sanhedrin council that he was a part of. That's the Jewish court. He's a secret disciple, but he didn't stand up for Jesus. But he sure as heck made sure that he was buried, respectfully buried. Now, there are questions out there. Did he, I mean, he, he obviously adored Jesus. He was a secret disciple. He wanted to make sure he was buried properly by Jewish law, Jewish custom. 
There's are, you may hear chatters out there. Some people, there's nothing in the Bible that says it that's possible that somehow he might have been related to Jesus in some way. And that's only because there was a custom that the oldest living male relative would be responsible for the body off of a crucifixion. So if you ever hear Joseph of Arimathea was Jesus' <clears throat> uncle or you know, anything like that. that, it's not in the Bible, but that's where it comes from, that there was this rule out there, that the oldest. So Joseph marries Joseph, Jesus' adopted father, if you will. Um, he's not around. He's obviously not around. There's no mention of him, so he's gone. So could this have been a brother and he would, we don't know. But what we do know is he made sure that Jesus was buried. He went to Pilate about it. Again, secret disciple, but did not stand up for Jesus, but did make sure that Jesus was buried. Now we have Nicodemus. And John writes in the 19th chapter this, Nicodemus, who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes weighing about 100 pounds. So maybe, bets, maybe there were some frankincense or myrrh there. Who knows? They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices and linen cloths according to the burial customs of the Jews. So Nicodemus, we know, this is the Pharisee, right? He comes to Jesus in the night, under the cover of night. He doesn't want to be in the light. He wants to be in the night. Um, and he struggles. Remember, he struggles to understand Jesus. What do you mean I have to be born again? He just couldn't, couldn't grasp it. Um, but here's the thing. He was not a disciple, but he stood up for Jesus among the Pharisees, if you remember. He said, shouldn't this man be, have a hearing? If he's being charged, he should have a hearing. So here you have Nicodemus, who's not a disciple, hasn't chosen to be a disciple, but he's standing up for Jesus. And then you have Joseph Arimathea is a secret disciple, but he doesn't stand up for Jesus. But both men tend to Jesus' body very uh, lovingly, if you will. So they're sympathizers, basically. They didn't fully believe in the resurrection. But they're active members. And they do what they, they need to do. They do what they need to do. Wayne, we were talking about what you, the women needed to do. They did what they needed to do out of their own sense of uh, devotion and commitment to Jesus. So does it matter that they had doubts about Jesus? Yeah. Was there a new disciple in the resurrection? Eventually, when they saw him, right? Well, yeah, yeah, Thomas not, wanted to feel the, right? But yeah. not before him, right? Why? Well, seemingly no, not yet, right? Right? It's a heck of a thing to, to, to believe in, right? Um, they wouldn't have known about it. Uh, it didn't happen yet. That that right. happen because they weren't Jewish. So. Well, they listened to Jesus. They, they, they listened, yeah. and he did say the temple would be raised right. on the third day. Not all of them were really even getting what the heck he was saying. It was, well, yeah, he was I talked to the confirmants today about, you know, God's so far up here. Human comprehension is of all of it is, I mean, just think of the Trinity alone. And, but um, anyway, it doesn't matter that Nicodemus didn't become a disciple. Hmm? I don't think so. Well, I mean, Jesus loved him, right? Jesus died for them, for them too. Both were called to righteous action in his name. So then, does it matter if we have active people in the church that aren't members? Just putting that out there. Why Does, would, hmm? why, why would it matter? It's the same kind of thing we're talking about, it, right? So, in turn, well, they can't vote for one. Right? Does it matter? We're not going to treat them differently. Right? We're going to welcome them. We're going to love them. We're going to care for them. It doesn't matter if we have people in our pews that are regular 
attenders, or even members that struggle, secretly struggle, with the resurrection. It's a heck of a thing to wrap your head around, right? The disciples needed to see it for themselves. We, you know, there are those of us that, that believe without a shadow of doubt, but there are others that doubt, and it's okay. Because we talk, also talked today about when you ask questions, the hard questions, that's when faith grows. You grow in faith. So we don't treat the people different, do we? We just love them. And, uh, you know, Jesus cared for everybody, loved everybody, regardless of whether they were a disciple or a secret disciple or stood up for them or didn't. You know, we have disciples that denied Jesus. Right? So. Either way, Right. Right. Somebody over here, I don't remember who it was, was talking about when Jesus called his mother a woman. Was it you or was it you? It also touches on the humanity of Jesus. And that's the other thing, right? It's not like Jesus was 50% human, 50% divine, so he's one. He's 100% human, 100% divine. And that's right so humanity of Jesus he says from the cross um, why have you forsaken me right but here's the thing God didn't forsake Jesus why do you think that is God was there. I mean, as Lutherans, we talk about uh, the theology of the cross, that God's hidden, present but hidden. So that, not that heady thing I'm not talking about. But God is there, and God mourns, and nature mourns. Can you think of anything that would have happened that allows us, it enables us to think, yeah, this is true. God mourns, nature mourns. One of the paintings somebody on the mentioned. Garden, on, on Good Friday, the, 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 sky is dark and the sky is dark. I think you had mentioned that, Jen, right? The sky is dark. Mm -hmm. What else happened? Was there an earthquake? Earthquake. The, the, the nature's trembling in mourning. So if you have gods in mourning, let's go back to the women beating their chest or tearing their garments. God's house, the torn from the top down. The veil is torn from. It's almost like God is tearing the garment of, um, in grief, in grief. But here's the thing, folks. If we look at this and we say, it's not a tragedy, though. This story that we tell and we pass on, and that's, it's not a tragedy because of the resurrection, because of the joy that Christ has conquered death. And we have that promise that we will live with him. He has prepared a place for us. So if it's not a tragedy, then is this story as hard as it is to wrap our head around it, a comedy. Because it's got a joyful ending in the end. And, and let's, I know, look at the faces and I get it. But th this is what she, she asked some really good questions. When we go to funerals, or we have funerals here, and we're devastated. And then we have the family remembrances. How many times do we laugh during those remembrances? Mm -hmm. And I think that's an important message to remember, is that, yes, the sadness is there. Yes, the mourning is there. And it's awful and it's horrific. But there's so much more joy, joy that we were blessed to have those people we loved in our lives, blessed that on account of Christ, conquering death,
preparing a place for us all, no matter if we're uh, a member or a disciple, doubts, fully faithful, full, you know, active, not active, Christ died, the, the one, Dismas or Gesmas, Christ, if, that was, if they were their names, we don't know, the men on the cross next to him. We all are promised that um, Christ died for us all. And so there's a lot of joy in that. And I, I think it's, it's Easter Day, you know, and so many things now. It's like it's so hard, you know. I just got off uh, our pastor call with Bishop, and some, we do, she does this every month to check in. Um, it's hard. It's, it's, it's hard. We're coming out of pandemic. Ukraine's on everybody's mind. You know, everybody else has other things going on. But at the same time, there's this joy of this. Look, we're gathered. I can't tell you how many congregations aren't doing this right now. They're just not there yet. So um, I've really treasured this time. And I'm curious, have you, because um, we share, we continue the story on these roles. You know, there's times that we step in as the scoffers in this world, unfortunately, but we do. There's times that we are the Simon of Cyrene that feel like we're the only ones bearing the cross. We're doing it alone. There, there's times when um, we just really need a miracle to happen, like the guy on the cross. You know, can't you do this? Why can't you do this? Make that miracle happen when we get desperate. Um, are there times that we're admiring Jesus more so than worshiping Jesus? And do we continue to pound our chests, sorry at home, <laughs> at the injustices that continue to go on? Um, and do we seek mercy for ourselves for our own indiscretions and sins, and yet at the same time fall into harsh judgment on others. I think that happens a lot lately um, among us all. So we filled in these backstories of these witnesses at the cross. We don't know every detail about them. But again, I want to end this, and I'm not going to make you sing tonight because you're going to sing on Sunday. But I want to read again AJ's words. And again, if, if anybody wants to borrow the books or wants to watch the video at some point, I'm happy to do that. But this is what she has said. Listen closely. Jesus has died. The witnesses have departed. For witnesses' memories are fragile. They fade with time. They transform when others share the story of the same event. Sometimes when witnesses tell the story, they elaborate or they use a metaphor that will become for later a fact. Points get lost or found in translation rather than engage in a futile attempt to determine who exactly the witnesses were at the cross, what they saw, what they did, we readers do well to listen to their stories and see how their stories transform us. At that point, we pick up the story ourselves. So we are continuing the gospel story, sharing the message of Christ's love for us all. The end. Any discussions? You're so quiet. <laughs> How did you find the series? Did you like it overall? Yeah. yeah. Was it too heavy for a soup supper mm -hmm. Latin yeah. series? Yeah. I thought it was interesting. I mean, I, I myself never really took the time to um, look at the paintings of him being taken down from the cross. Oh, but so I guess it's. No, there's a, she did. She raised a lot of things that, that we don't really take the time for. So thank you all for uh, being a part of this.
And yeah, I've killed a lot of trees, I apologize. And thank you at home. I know a lot of you have chatted, and a number of you like to text me later. So thank you for your, your inputs.